Like a ship needs an expert sailor, college campuses need our science. The science of human behavior can achieve meaningful improvements in the lives of any individual, no matter the population. Leonardo da Vinci said this, those who fall in love with practice without science are like a sailor who enters a ship without a helm or a compass. You can never be certain whither he is going. Many university staff love what they do and for good reasons. Helping young professionals achieve their career goals can be very fulfilling, but it can also be quite challenging. When university staff encounter these challenges, it can feel a bit like a sailor leading a ship without a helm or a compass. The science of human behavior can help. It can serve as a helm. It can serve as a compass. It can produce the knowledge of how to navigate the challenging waters that come along with helping young students achieve their career goals. A common goal for students is getting a job after graduation. There's sort of a good news, bad news situation for recent college graduates. Each of these graduate caps represents 100,000 students. In total, they represent the estimated 2.8 million Americans who graduated in the spring of 2015. The good news is that a majority of recent grads do have jobs. Only 6% are without a job. There's still 2.6 million graduates who, after graduating, got a job, and that's good news. But there's also bad news. An additional proportion of college grads are underemployed. Now, underemployment means that graduates are taking jobs that don't require a degree. This means that there are over a million students who, after years of time and thousands of dollars, didn't get a job that required a college degree. Now, of course, students can be unemployed or underemployed due to a lack of qualifications. However, it's reasonable to suspect that some of these students are well qualified, but are without a job due to a lack of interview skills. Now, I can relate because, like many others, I failed an interview. I failed that interview because I looked nervous, I gave poor answers, and I didn't ask good questions. Unlike many others, my interview wasn't for a job or graduate school. It was for a girl when I was nine years old. In the third grade, I had a crush on Janet Carlson. So when I heard there was a school dance, I decided that I wanted to be Janet's date. I was highly, highly qualified. Uh, as a kid, I spent hours dancing. Now, I didn't know how to waltz or even slow dance, but I did know how to dance to Vanilla Ice, which went a really long way for a kid in the early 90s. Despite these qualifications, I uh, didn't get the date because I failed the interview. The interview happened during a rehearsal for a school-wide recital. Janet and I were backstage waiting to practice our skit. Uh, she, she was dressed as a cat, uh, and I was wearing this toucan costume. And the interview happened with just one question. Janice said, I like you. Are you going to spring dance? Now I froze and I became a very stiff, flat-faced boy wearing this toucan costume. I looked at Jana and she looked at me I could feel the nerves rushing around all throughout my body, but I wasn't prepared for this. I didn't know what to say. And before I could think of something clever to say, it just slipped out. And I said, I like me too. So let's review. Did I look nervous? Absolutely. And this toucan outfit wasn't helping matters. Did I give uh, good answers. 
No, I've thought about this for a long time, and I've yet to think of a single question where I like me too is a good answer to a question. Did I ask good questions? No. I didn't ask any questions, let alone the one question that I should have asked. The point is this, that college graduates fail interviews for similar types of performance. A good interviewer looks composed in their body posture and facial expressions. They say the right things and they say them the right way. To increase their chances of employment, college students might seek services at career centers on college campuses. And at those career centers, students are likely to find pamphlets on common interview mistakes, typical questions, uh, or what to wear to an interview. If a center has adopted best practice, they will provide simulated interviews and feedback on student performance. Surveys suggest that around 79% of new college graduates use career center services in their final year, and they report that simulated interviews were among the most helpful services. Now, there are studies that show that career centers do improve the chances of some folks getting jobs. But it isn't working for every student. There are other surveys that show 66% of employers suggesting that recent college graduates need to improve their interview skills. This discrepancy appears to me to suggest that there's a need to improve interview training on college campuses. And in my opinion, I think career center services are often limited by a one-size-fits-all approach. Like a suit that is not tailored, the existing interview training research is limited by its focus on the average student. In the same way that suits come in different styles and sizes and colors, students come with their own unique experiences or personalities or skill deficits. Some students might need more extensive training than others. Some might not need explicit training on certain skills, and there may not always be a universal training method that works for every person. In other words, there's a need for more behavior analytic research and practice on a personalized approach to interview training on college campuses. The way that we taught students to give good answers ask good questions, and look composed during interviews is a lot like tailoring a suit. Here's a brief video showing you some of our general procedures. In the same way that a tailor starts by getting someone's unique measurements before he alters a suit, we started by meeting with participants and asking them about their history, goals, and skill set with respect to interviews. To assess student performance, we simulated interviews for job or graduate schools identified by the students. After this initial assessment phase, like a tailor proceeds to alterations, we proceeded to training. Our training includes instructing and modeling skills, followed by role play and feedback. Each training session ended with a brief simulated interview that focused on the skill targeted during training. After a brief interview, students wrote self-evaluations that focused on the main points from training and how well they performed those skills during the brief interview. We included this component because self-evaluations were used to occasion feedback from the experimenter and it produced written notes that students could use in the future. To assess the effects of our behavioral alterations, we returned to a series of simulated interviews that were identical to those in baseline. A good tailor tests the durability of his work. Because interviews for jobs or graduate school might take place in a wide variety of settings several months after training, we assess the extent to which trained skills persist over time in untrained contexts for some, but not all, participants. As you'll see in the article, every student we worked with acquired target skills, and they reported that they were satisfied with the outcomes. However, there were individual differences. Some students required more extensive training than others. In addition, we didn't need to target the same skills for every student. And there was not one training method that was universally effective for every student. As behavior analysts, we are equipped with a skill set to identify interview training 
that will achieve socially significant outcomes for every student. What we do is needed on college campuses around the country. I see research on interview training as a chance to spread behavior analysis to an uncommon area, to get behavior analysis into mainstream higher education. But if we're going mainstream and we must consider the practicality of our work, we are good at developing highly effective behavioral technology, but we are not always great at developing technology that is practical. We've been here before. Fred Keller's personalized system of instruction is highly individualized teaching. It works, but very few professors use it because it is resource intensive. What we did works, but it could be a full-time job to work on interview skills with just a few individuals. Our procedures took roughly six to 14 hours per participant. And to help a broader number of students, we may need to consider a multi-tiered approach to interview training. Response to intervention is a three-tiered approach to treating problem behavior in educational settings. It might be summarized as teaching for all, some, or one. Children progress from the bottom tier to the top based on need. An RTI approach to interview training might consist of training uh, within a first year course taken by all students, training embedded into a core course within a major, and personalized training offered through a collaboration between behavior analysts and staff at a career center. College campuses need our science like a ship needs an expert sailor. There is a need for more research and practice on a personalized approach like the one described in our study. Through more behavior analytic research and practice, we can develop the knowledge required to navigate the challenging waters that come along with helping students achieve their professional goals.